So the key focus of this presentation is to take a couple of different perspectives that different people in the room will probably have seen different pieces of and combine them together to help get you to look at this stuff in a different way. And I'm really gonna talk about four key things today. The first is gonna be the state of engineering and quality rigor in, that's applied to the products that are used in this industry. I'm also gonna talk about some of the ways in which you can increase that rigor and coupled with that, the impact of that increased rigor on both the products and the processes that deliver those products. And then the last thing I'll do is wrap it up with a discussion about the value for end users. And really this is gonna be an explanation of why this is important and why companies should care and why operators should drive the kinds of things I wanna talk about today. So first off, to start with, um, the whole PDF space is really low cost driven. That should not be a surprise to anyone, but it's usually a, a, something that's not necessarily very intuitive if you don't work in this space a lot. So the focus is almost exclusively on front end costs, things that are very tangible, very predictable, very easy to put on a balance sheet. Um, for those of you that are familiar in any way with the Six Sigma quality world, you will have seen the iceberg schematic before that does a comparison between visible costs and hidden costs. And generally what you find in a lot of industries and in the PDF space is no exception, is that the hidden costs, because they're not very well understood, they're either completely ignored through ignorance or they're viewed as being so insignificant that it's not worth the time, trouble, effort, or money of companies to investigate looking into those hidden costs uh, to gain a little bit of value out of. So we're gonna take a slight tangent for a second and there is a key topic that I wanna talk about that's really gonna help underpin the entire rest of the presentation. And that is the difference between commodity products and engineered products. Because in the PVF space, everything we talk about is talked about as a commodity item. They're bought and sold like commodity items. They're viewed as commodity items. And to an engineer, those two terms have a very specific and very different connotation. A commodity product is 100% defined by an industry code. All the information that you need, geometry, dimensions, tolerances, manufacturing processes, materials, quality testing, pressure testing, Everything that you need is defined by the industry code. So a committee from a group like ASME or someone else has done the engineering work for you so that nobody else has to. An engineered product, on the other hand, does not have 100% of that definition. And so you find that there are things that need to be determined in addition to whatever information you start with to be able to successfully deliver those products. And I've got two very quick examples that I'll walk through. The first is a comparison between four steel threaded fittings and hammer units. Four steel threaded fittings are 100% defined by a spec written by ASME. You can give that spec to a machine shop, they can make you those fittings. You don't need any other information of any kind. When you look, and because of that, when you start to look at things like the four steel threaded fittings, products that are well defined like that are also 100% interchangeable across different manufacturers. You can take out company A's fitting, you can put in company B's fitting, and you don't have to worry that there's gonna be a problem or an issue. When you look at hammer unions, on the other hand, it's a very different paradigm. There is no single universal code. There is no single universal standard. And what you have is a loose association of geometries created by different manufacturers. They are similar, but they are not identical. And one of the challenges that comes from that has to do with compatibility. Some manufacturers' components interchange some of the time with some of their manufacturers' components. But as an end user or a facility, uh, someone that delivers a facility to an end user, you pretty much have to figure that stuff out. And that can be a little bit complicated. The other example I'll talk about is in the groove space. When you look at groove fittings and groove couplings, you find that there is a design code that offers a little bit of information. It gives you about half of what's needed. And so when you look at different manufacturers, you look at the same product, you tend to see some differences. And the example I can show you here is what you see on the bottom right of the slide is two fittings. They are the same size, four inch. They're the same style, 45 elbow. They are made of the same material. They have the same pressure rating and they are made for the exact same application. Can anybody tell me what's different between the two? One of them has twice the wall thickness of the other. And so from this comes a question that is deceptively simple, but has very serious implications because there's only two ways that you get here. Option number one is they were both designed exactly the same. 
One of them's made right, one of them's made wrong. Or they're both made correctly, which means they were designed differently. And as soon as you understand that one of those or the other could be the root cause, and that it's very, very difficult to tell the difference, that's really where the key takeaway point comes from, is the poor engineering behind the product is often mistaken for low quality. And it can be very, very difficult, even for someone who designs those products, to be able to really tell the difference when you're looking at a competitor's product. So the issue is that now in this commodity space, where you talk about products that are treated as true commodity items, you begin to rationalize that sometimes there's an engineering component that adds a variable to the complexity, and that in turn creates a step change in trying to figure out some of these problems. And when you look at the commodity space, what you, or sorry, the PV of space, what you generally see is a series of anecdotal perceptions about brands and about country of origin. And that's what a lot of, especially in the smaller operators, that's how they will make decisions about which products to buy, where to get them from. They're, one of the most common things you see in the space we work in is there are companies that will say to us, we buy domestic only, we don't buy import. And that is an, that is an, an expression of that concern based on the branding. Well, when you start throwing into the mix that this could be an engineering issue and not a manufacturing and quality issue, it makes those kinds of assertions very, very difficult to demonstrate as actually adding value. So the impact that the operators come up with to deal with this very complex, very unusual problem that is a supply chain with a myriad of manufacturing, quality, and engineering challenges that have to be sorted out is to employ an excessive sparing philosophy. And by that, I mean, I need three pieces that work, so I'm going to buy 10. And at Titus, for most of our customers, that is a common thing we hear every single day, is that that is the normal philosophy that's applied for how you buy this kind of equipment. Now, while this is an effective strategy, it is not efficient because it creates a problem that everybody in this room ends up having to pay for and account for. So if the operator has to buy three times of what they need, that means the supply store has to stock three times the product of the actual demand. That means they have to have three times the warehouse space. That means their utility costs for lights in the warehouse are three times the amount. That means three times the warehouse staff. When you start going backward in the supply chain, you look at the wholesaler, the distributor, all the way back to the OEM, everybody has to feed the beast. So everybody has to produce a significantly larger volume of product and incur the larger inventory carrying costs in order to facilitate the operator sparing philosophy. There are some pretty significant costs associated with that, and the costs all at the end of the day get passed on to the end users. So one of the other things that's important to understand before we start talking about how to increase the rigor and what, what impact that brings is that a lot of these products, grooved, hammer unions, a lot of the forged steel stuff, these products were all developed prior to the 1960s. Engineering methods employed then are, were very, very simple, as were manufacturing methods. Group stuff traces its roots back to pre-World War I. Hammer unions are back to the late 40s, early 50s, depending on who you talk to. Forged steel that's threaded with NPT is around the turn of the century. And engineering calculations were not as common then as they are today. Um, manufacturing processes like casting and machining were 100% manual, very labor intensive. So it was the art of making drafting for engineering drawings. So you had a tremendous amount of work that had cost and lead time associated with it, and that was the standard with how all this stuff was produced. You also saw in those days testing being a key fundamental part of the front end engineering design process. If you had a couple of different ideas, you built four or five prototypes, took them out of the shop, you tested them, and that was part of how you screened out the good, the bad, and the better ideas. A lot of the codes that we follow for regulatory compliance today also either did not exist or were in their infancy when a lot of these products were being put into the market for the first time. And by the time these, some of these products had become field proven and tried and true, these codes were still in their infancy. So the codes took sort of a unique approach of if it ain't broke, don't fix it. So you have the ability to grandfather in stuff through extensive field experience and service experience rather than traditional, or what we would call now traditional engineering. Now coupled with this, in the modern day, you have a lot of knockoff products that are available in this product space. Uh, some of the companies that do these knockoffs like to describe them as being reverse engineered. In its simplest form, reverse engineering is somebody taking a part, 
taking dial calipers, measuring dimensions, and making them draw. There's no calculations. There's no understanding of design intent. They take a guess at tolerances because they're not using an analytical process to determine tolerances. They're trying to guess with what they hope will happen. And when you look at three or four generations of a product that have gone through three or four different companies, you will see changes to the products over time. And, and the people that do this really well will be very conservative. But it's how you can end up with one part being twice as thick as the other after 50 years of reverse engineering efforts and people making copies of copies of copies. Modern engineering methods, on the other hand, are a game changer for products in the PVS space. This is an FEA we did at Titus of a grooved end cap made by one of our competitors. For those of you that are not familiar with mechanical FEA, anything that's red is bad because that means that the mechanical stress on this part is actually exceeding the yield strength of the material. This was done at graded working pressure of 1,000 PSI. There is not a single pressure containing code on the earth today that would look at this kind of analysis and say, yep, this is good for code compliance. None of, none of the codes will. Yet this product is grandfathered in because of extensive service experience, and it is considered to be acceptable to sell in the marketplace. So one of the things that you get out of these engineering methods is you get better predictability of performance, and that's really, really key. The next thing is that you get a really strong enhancement of the efficiency of the engineering process as a whole. Tools like 3D Parametric CAD can allow you to generate entire product families of similar but distinctly different products very, very quickly. You also have the way to make changes very, very quickly. You also get the ability to optimize the balance between performance and cost. If your entire program for developing a product is purely through pressure testing, the two samples I showed on the previous slide, they both mean code. They're both okay. They both work very, very well. They both have about the, uh, the same upper limit because for those particular fittings, it's not the fittings that'll burst at those pressures. You generally break something else in the system before you break the fittings. So they both, they both have the same end performance, but one of them has twice the material of the other. Well, that means it has twice the cost. And so the question is, for, tw for twice the cost, what extra value do you get? And the answer is you really don't get any value. And balancing the cost and the performance is something that you can do when you have an analytical engineered process as part of your product development cycle. One other key thing is that testing moves from being a very front-end mainstay activity for product development, it moves to the back. It becomes the last thing that you do. When you look at what I would call more critical or heavy-duty products. You look at things like API 6A gate valves, blowout preventers. You don't do a great deal of pressure containment testing as part of product development, but you do one right before every single product goes out the door because it's the last stage, and that validation is essentially making sure that all the other work that you've done is actually correct. So testing can be very expensive. It requires a lot of effort. There are huge safety risks. Um, and moving testing to the back end adds a lot of value for companies that are trying to develop these products and get them off the ground. Design for manufacturability is a big one that's very close to my heart because before I went to college, I spent five years working in a machine shop as a machinist. This is a CNC lathe in a Titus factory. And one of the things that many people don't realize is that CNC, which stands for Computer Numerical Control, it's the process we use to automate machine tools in the modern day, does not just automate manufacturing. There are geometries that you can produce on a CNC lathe or a CNC mill that are not physically possible of being produced on the manual equivalents. So by migrating manufacturing to CNC control, you've expanded the opportunities for what, in, what you can actually economically produce in terms of geometry. That gives engineers more tools and more options to be able to produce products and solve bigger problems without having to go outside of the economic structure of the manufacturing process. The last thing really has to do, and this, this I think is the one that's the most important, but most people agree that this is probably the simplest, and that has to do with doing your due diligence and having appropriate checks. In the PBS space, you don't see a lot of people that keep very good records. You don't see a lot of quality checks. And the reality is that it doesn't take a lot of extra work to do this, but Keeping track, for example, with forged steel, looking at your mill material that's going to come out of a, a pipe or bar mill somewhere, doing a quick MTR, making sure you understand the chemistry, 
And then when you get to the end of production, you can do another check on your finished goods. The same batch of steel from one heat coat, a couple of different samples, they're not going to be identical. But there's a big difference when one piece has three times the phosphorus and half the carbon of the other. And it can be a very good indicator of fraud. It can be a very good indicator of just an honest mistake. But by doing these checks, it gives you intervention points that as a manufacturer, you can step in and say, hang on a minute, we contracted out this manufacturing, we agreed it was this material, but all the finished goods we're testing, something's not right. The mechanical properties are wrong, the chemistry's wrong, we think that somebody might have switched material. And sometimes that happens on purpose because somebody doesn't want to buy the higher end material that you wanted. Sometimes somebody grabs the wrong bar off of a rack. And this is the easiest way to catch that stuff. Being able to track back and track forward means that you have the ability to not just manage this stuff through manufacturing, but you also have the ability to step forward and look at your end user who has the product in their hand and can read you the heat code. And then you can come back and hand them an entire quality book of information that talks about what raw material batch it came out of, when it was made, when it was shipped, what the chemistry was in two or three different places, what the mechanical properties were. And it helps to provide an enormous amount of forensic value for that data if there's a failure in the field. It also helps you give customers peace of mind that what you're trying to buy and sell them is exactly what they're getting. Okay, so now we'll change gears a little bit and talk about well, what's the impact of this increased rigor. So the biggest thing is that these advanced engineering tools and methods create an opportunity to do what I have always heard referred to as technical value engineering. When people talk about value engineering, they generally are talking about cost reduction. There's a huge commercial component. They're talking about contract negotiation and outsourcing to lower cost countries and that sort of thing. But there are huge opportunities to make changes to a product design that can take cost out. Going back to the example of the two group fittings, that's a perfect example. You can cut the cost of that product by 50%. And you're not sacrificing any performance. You're not changing the critical safe nature of the product. All you're doing is taking out excess work, excess material that's not really needed and doesn't add any value. And the key thing is that when that's integrated into a very robust engineering process, it means that you can ensure that those cost reductions are not going to create problems with performance. There, with tools like FEA, you also have the ability to reduce the amount of material, reduce the amount of effort, reduce the cost, while actually increasing the product performance. Uh, another, th another impact that comes from this is you have the ability to take product engineering knowledge and understanding of the manufacturing processes and the process performance and put them together in a feedback loop. And where this ad begins to add value is that you can identify weak points in the manufacturing process and you can make changes to the design in a predictive fashion that give you the ability to mitigate that process variability. So for example, if you have a, an area of a manufacturing process that tends to have a lot of variability for wall thickness, you can make the wall a little bit thicker. And what that does is it does, you do spend a little bit more money on the front end of the manufacturing. But the advantage to it is that you don't have to spend a lot of time on the back end having engineers review non-conformancy reports and provide engineering disposition. Um, so there's a, there's a cost savings for how that group is set up because a lot of the PDF manufacturers and distributors, they take very much a throw it over the wall approach. You know, we got it, we bought a whole bunch of it. And when you listen to the marketing presentations from a lot of those providers, the thing they love to brag about the most is how big your warehouse is. Because what they're really talking about is their ability to feed that sparing philosophy. That means there, there's no review of products that aren't right. It's very simply, a, if you're not happy with it, give it back to us and we'll give you another one. And I've got so many of them that I can do that. So when, when you start looking at the ability to mitigate some of these problems, you don't have to have that very large warehouse because even if you do have an issue or a problem, you've addressed it preemptively. The next thing is, and this is, I think, going to be the, probably the most difficult thing for you all to see, has to do with the fact that there's a unique thing that if you've never worked in a machine shop, it won't make a great deal of sense. I'll try my best to explain it. When you roll out automated manufacturing through CNC, you are changing the paradigm of what those machine operators do on a daily basis. On manual machines, 100% of their day has been interacting with the machine, turning dials, pulling levers. There's no stops, there's no brakes. 
if they take if they stop to go to the restroom, that means there's no machining going on. With CNC, it's very different. Operator puts a part into the machine, closes the door, hits the start button, and has anywhere from two and a half to ten minutes of just standing there. And so the shop I worked in employed a very specific philosophy of, I'm paying you the same amount of money whether you stand there and do nothing or if you do something. So what I want you to do is I want you to take the part you just took out of the machine and start doing what's called whip inspection or work in process inspection. And to the left of this machine, you'll see a table. On the top shelf on the far right is an NPT plug gauge. This is a Titus lathe and a Titus factory that makes uh, some of our hammer unions. And what we do at the factory level is you make the machine operators check and gauge all of the threads they just cut. Which means if there's a problem that develops with the machine, if there's a cutting insert that breaks, if there's a tool that slips and moves, you don't find out about it at the end of manufacturing when you've produced 500 parts that are scrap. Your scrap goes down to one or two because somebody goes, hey, this gauge doesn't fit in all the way. We need to stop and figure out this problem before we waste any more iron. So that's one of the things that you do have to drive at the factory level, but you can't do it in a manual machine shop. It can only be done in a CNC machine shop. So it's a way that you can add a lot of value, and it's one of the impacts that comes from using that automated manufacturer. This lets it behave as an early warning feature for the factory QA system. And there's a tremendous amount of value in that, especially when you think in the import product world about the lead time for shipping. And if you get to the end of manufacturing and that's when you find out you've got a problem, you don't have to go back and explain to your customer that you have to remake the order and it's going to be a little bit later. And that's a lot different than what you see with the guys who simply stock so much of it that if they have a problem, they can replace a crate, they can replace a brand simply because they're sitting on that inventory that the end users are paying them to carry. All of these things together have the end effect of improving the supply chain yield over the traditional approach that's used for PVF products. You end up getting a lower scrap rate. You end up with products that are engineered a bit better. And so when you start trying to do side-by-side -side comparison tests, when you do destructive testing, when, when you really sit down and do a strong technically based comparison, what you find is that what's coming out of that supply chain, you've got a tighter range of variability and you've got better performance. You, you do have the definition of better quality. And the worst case scenario is that you find a non-conforming product that gets blocked at export. So you don't have to worry about it getting all the way to the well site and then finding out, oh, hey, this stuff doesn't work. Now I've got to jump through hoops to find somebody who can deliver $60,000 worth of pipe valve and fitting in 24 hours. Otherwise, I've got to send the work crew home I've got to take all these other activities that I've spent a couple of months planning for and, and I've now been put into a hurry up and wait situation and all that does is, is raise the cost of doing business. So for the last piece of this, when we talk about the value rate realized by the end users, the number one thing is safety. When you have products that are properly engineered and you have products that are properly manufactured and are produced under a rigorous QA system, the end result is that you're going to get products that are safer. You're going to have less uncertainty. You're going to have fewer concerns because some of the stuff you're putting fairly high pressures. This, this equipment, if it's not made right, can hurt or kill people. And that's really, at the end of the day, what everybody's focus should be. It also gives you the ability to have products that have enhanced performance. And if you are a manufacturer, you can literally come in and say, well, we can demonstrate better capacity than the same products from our competitors. We can give you higher pressures. We can give you larger sizes. We give you the flexibility to purchase product that's going to help you be a more efficient, better cash flow business. You can also get longer service life. There's a lot of subtle detail that goes into the engineering of pressure containing products. And when the engineering is done by people that really understand that subtlety, you have the ability to step in and say, if your biggest problem is the product's not lasting long enough, there is a solution for that. We as a manufacturer can go up, we can make a change to our product, we can deliver a product specifically for you, or we could say, you know what, there's a completely different product line that's probably going to meet your needs better than the one that you're buying. And so there's, there's a way to make that partnership work better for the end users. And you also have the opportunity to reduce complexity. The oil and gas industry is, I think, far and away one of the most complicated that has ever existed in the history of our species. And about 15 years ago, there was a magazine that published an article describing specifically the deep water drilling and completion of wells as being an activity 
that is so sophisticated that it was on par with putting a man on the moon. Which means if you want to do something more sophisticated than oil and gas, you physically have to leave the planet. There's a lot of complexity in what we do, right? And whenever you, whenever you have a technical resource in an OEM that can come in and help an end user take some of that complexity out, there's value on both sides. There's value for someone like Titus because we're going to sell you a problem. But there's also value for you because it means you're going to have an easier time doing what you do, and that's going to put less strain on your own resources. Value engineered products also can result in some significantly reduced costs. When I sat down and did the pressure calculations for all of the low pressure hammer unions, and I went as comparison by some of the standard products available in industry, and I'm talking about two inch, three inch, and four inch FIG 200, FIG 400 hammer unions, the real world safety factors on these are like seven or eight. Buildings are not designed that robustly, nor are bridges. So you have products that are so robust that, that they're at a point where there's so much material in it that's not really adding any value. And there's opportunities to streamline those products. And when you do proper technical value engineering, you have the opportunity to capture and then turn around and deliver that value. The biggest challenge on our end is trying to explain this to people as a, our product's not cheaper because we're cutting corners, it's cheaper because we've actually optimized the design of the products we're selling. And that's something you really don't see very much in the PBS space. Um, when you impose, and this is, I think, for the, for the end users in the room, this is going to be one of the big ones for you guys. The improvements to engineering and manufacturing quality give you the opportunity to change or to eliminate your sparing philosophy. You don't have to buy 10 to get three that work. You can buy three that, to get three that work, or four to get three that work. When you do this, you're going to take demand out of that supply chain. You're going to undo some of the bloat. And there's, a, there's a, a really good reason why you would want to do that as the price of oil goes up. As demand for product increases, that capacity already exists. So if the products are streamlined and you take that supply chain and trim it down a little bit so there's extra capacity in that supply chain, that capacity can then be used to produce a greater quantity of product that can then be used to deliver more projects. It also reduces the supply chain cost because it takes you from, I've got to support and subsidize three times my demand to counteract quality problems to, I need to support 100% of my demand plus a little bit extra so I have room for growth. And it also creates a lot of opportunity for you guys to really free up a bunch of capital. You're not tying up money in the product. You're not tying up money in the inventory carrying costs. And that means, and that money can be used in a lot of different ways. You can deliver more projects. You can fund additional improvement initiatives. You can fund R&D on other things. But however you choose to use that freed up capital, it's going to positively impact the bottom line of the business. And at the end of the day, that's something that, since the price crash in 2014, every E&P company on earth wants to talk about capital discipline, being more efficient, making make, do, the, the phrase doing more with less or doing more with the same, 